Good afternoon, Mr. Mitchell. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for uh, stopping by. Uh, Thank you for having studio. me. Yeah. Um, you testified at two uh, congressional uh, hearings uh, in the last six years on Cambodia. Uh, the one in 2013, you advocate for a better engagement uh, with Cambodia and urged the U.S. to uh, change some policy to adapt to uh, new uh, challenges faced by uh, China. But in the last week uh, hearing, uh, you seem to be a little bit out of patience, uh, saying that the Cambodian strongman has stifled the rule of law. It has come to the road to despotism. So can you explain a little bit more? Well, I'm I concerned, uh, obviously. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm not a supporter of the CNRP. Um, I have a lot of respect for the, what the CPP has accomplished. They've led Cambodia through a period of incredible growth, and things are much better than, than when I started in 2002. Uh, am I frustrated? Yes. Um, as I explained during the hearing, we've had a situation where we have a plantation. We've had it for almost 20 years. Uh, it was seized extrajudicially, and you know, it, it causes a tremendous amount of uncertainty as a businessman and as, as an investor. So as a businessman and investor, I'm concerned about rule of law. Uh, I happen to be at a human rights hearing but that was more of a function of the venue that uh, became available. And their interest was, without rule of law, you, you aren't going to have human rights, you aren't going to have democracy. Um, and I see that as foundational. Mm. The strong man, you know, the Prime Minister has always uh, more or less been referred to as a strong man and not in a derogatory way. Uh, and my personal views, um, there are some scholars, um, Samuel Huntington was the first, uh, Francis Fukuyoka was, Fukuyama was the most recent, who put forward that there are many, many different paths to democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, the U.S. took its path, uh, but in emerging economies, it might be necessary for there to be a period of quote-unquote strongman rule during which the institute, institutions which are required for democracy have an opportunity to develop and mature. My concern is, is that since the 2018 election, or more specifically 2017 commune elections, those institutions are no longer maturing. And mm -hmm. the situation with the Chinese coming into Cambodia, they if they do not mature, then Cambodia's democracy will be at risk. Mm. Yeah, I will uh, continue on the, uh, the Chinese uh, and the investment in the country. But can you also uh, walk us through how you how was your land? I believe it was a land concession uh, agreement uh, was taken. <coughs> Actually, this uh, this particular site uh, is a private lease. Oh. Um, we were told that the land had changed hands, which is a violation of the lease contract. Uh, we had physical possession of the land and had no intention of vacating it. How long was the lease? Uh, originally it was 70 years. There's been a change to the civil code which reduces it to 50 years. Uh, but uh, we've been on it since 2002 without any major issues since 2002. And we intended to just continue to do, do our business. Uh, it's teak. Uh, you know, we had the opportunity to, you know, we planted the teak, now we have the opportunity to turn that teak into outdoor furniture. It's an interesting story from a marketing standpoint. Uh, we've designed furniture that optimizes uh, the timber that's coming off this land, put a lot of work into it, and then literally in four months, half of it's gone. How big was the plantation? Uh, it would be uh, about uh, 150 acres. Uh, was the section that was taken, so it was sizable. Um, you know, millions of dollars have been lost. Uh, mm -hmm. Two things that happen when you lose a, a plantation in this manner. First of all, they just took the timber and sold it. Uh, without permits, it went to Vietnam. Uh, so it was illegally exported. Uh, second, they bulldozed the stumps. And teak, 
uh, once you get it established, will continue to grow from the stump. So you can harvest it and you don't have to replant, which means you don't have to weed, you don't have to worry about fire. All of the things we went through our first five years, we didn't have to do again. When those stumps get bulldozed, you lose that. And to be honest, that's worth as much or more no than No compensation the, at all? No, none. No, just uh, threats. So the kind of local investors, not kind of outside investors from well, there's, China? What, what is happening in, in Cambodia is the Chinese are buying up a lot of the land around us. And uh, mango plantations are very popular because uh, China is now exporting, allowing the import of Cambodian mangoes. That's been one of the, the measures they've taken to increase the uh, imports from Cambodia to China mm -hmm. because China is yeah, China is Cambodia's largest trading partner but only 3.9 percent of uh, Cambodia's exports go to China mm. yes 70 percent go to the US or Europe mm -hmm. so uh, because of the threat of EBA everything but arms being removed because of the pressure uh, uh, where the GSP program is being reviewed under which Cambodia is allowed to export to the United States travel goods without uh, duty. Mm -hmm. Alternatives are being explored. Okay. So how competitive is uh, the investment environment uh, in Cambodia given uh, uh, China different uh, practice of not caring about corruption or bribing a, a local government official? It's it's difficult. You know, as a U.S. citizen, I'm uh, covered under the U.S. Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Right. So, you know, they, I cannot pay off any officials. You know, there are some provisions for uh, facilitation payments, uh, things that you have to pay for to get job done. Mm -hmm. However, that's illegal in Cambodia. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I I have a, a set of standards that I have to work to that every other American has to work to in the country. Uh, Chinese, no, they're not covered under, um, they, to my knowledge, do not have the equivalent. Uh, what I'm observing, and it's an observation, I haven't quantified this, but mm. one of the real threats to Cambodian sovereignty from a practical standpoint is, you know, there's the, there's the money that comes in at the national level, but as you know, investments are made at the provincial level, the city level, village level, et cetera. Uh, you know, if politicians are paid off there, they don't follow national policies. Uh, you know, Sihanoukville is a good example of this, uh, where, you know, buildings get built without permits. Well, you know, how did that happen? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, policies are in place, they're just not being followed. And mm -hmm. The why is pretty obvious. Referring to the you know the calmness in during the election campaign that you call it, it was a sign of maturing democracy, but not anymore, right? Well, the I mean there isn't really a. <coughs> the, I read an article that was where there was a quote attributed to someone in the government that you know we didn't understand the Cambodian brand of democracy there isn't a brand of democracy where your opponents get put in prison. Um, now, I don't know what Kim Sokha did or did not do, but if there's charges and there's evidence, try him. Two you know, years without trial. Well, bring him to trial. Yeah. If he's guilty, he's guilty. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I have no idea. I don't know Kim Sokha. I don't... I saw the YouTube video, but... I work on the story since the day he was arrested. I, I broke the story also, and so far I haven't seen any I mean, evidence. My, my perspective on the, the, the entire political, and I'm not a politician, I'm a businessman. Know, yeah. um, so at the end of the day, it's up to the Cambodian people who run Cambodia. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have a say in that. Mm -hmm. From the standpoint of managing a business there, though, we, we look for stability and we look for predictability. And that becomes at risk when the, the systems that are, are supposed to be in place break down. Yeah. 
You also, uh, during the testimony, you also said uh, your company wrote to uh, the U.S. trade representative yes. on the, uh, you know, to suspend uh, trade uh, preferences that Cambodia enjoy, but retracted it, and you are considering doing it again. Will you do it? Yes. Uh, what, what it is is that under the, um, the U.S. laws that cover GSP, General System of Preferences, there is specific criteria mm -hmm. for a beneficiary company, a country. A beneficiary country cannot repudiate or nullify a contract with an American-owned company. If it's over 50% American-owned, they cannot do that. So we did pursue this with USTR. We've had an ongoing dialogue with USTR. Um, and as part of that ongoing dialogue, we withdrew the petition. Uh, hoping that we would find other means, and USTR has been very supportive. Uh, we um, very much appreciate that. But if the situation isn't resolved, then I have a fiduciary obligation to my investors to pursue mm. all legal means to recover their losses. And as such, yes, we, we would consider it the next window of opportunity. If we're not on a path to resolution, mm then yes, we would consider refiling. I'm interested in your first testimony. You said that whenever the U.S. pull out, the Chinese is willing to chip in. And uh, so even though the West tried to put san economic sanction on uh, Cambodia, China would cover it. So with this attitude, how hard it is or how challenging it is to kind of promote uh, human rights and democracy in C Cambodia. Because well, China, we know, uh, don't care about all these things. I mean, from, from the standpoint of the testimony in 2013, mm. we were looking at U.S. aid to Cambodia specifically. And yes, when the U.S. reduces aid, the Chinese increase mm. aid. That, mm. And that effectively played out. But what's much more, more important to the Cambodian economy, rather than foreign aid, is their trade, uh, specifically the garment and textiles, uh, which represents 70% uh, of the exports, I believe, 65, 70%. And uh, also the bicycle trade, which uh, the Cambodia is the leading uh, supplier of bicycles and bicycle parts to Europe. So these, are, these two are covered under everything but arms in Europe. And if Cambodia loses everything but arms, okay, they have an economy that is based upon textiles and light manufacturing, such as bicycles. If that goes away, the Chinese aren't going to buy the garments and they're not going to buy the bicycles and that you have an economy that, that's a critical component. Uh, the U.S. in 2016 granted GSP privileges for travel goods, uh, which is what we, we were considering petitioning. And so that the GSP program covers travel goods, allows uh, the duty-free import of backpack suitcases, uh, various travel goods. That has been responsible for most of the export growth, the vast majority of the export growth in uh, for Cambodia in total. Without that, the Cambodian exports would have declined 2% last year, not grown by 4%. So can the Chinese take up the slack on that? No, I don't think they can. They're, they're not in the market for those goods. Mm -hmm. So the, there's a an effort in Cambodia to try to replace these, but most of it's been agriculture products because there just isn't the demand in the Chinese market for the, for the other products that are m the mainstays for the economy. But the government of Cambodia has kind of uh, shown strong position saying that they are able to, you know, stand on their own for at least uh, six months. They are prepared for this. They have not shown any sh sign of, you know, giving in at all. W will this be good for the country? Well, it, wouldn't, it would not be good for the country. Mm -hmm. uh, if, this, if they lose EBA, if they lose GSP, mm -hmm. it would be very, very bad for the economy. 
mm -hmm. and for the Cambodian people. Um, now, can the Chinese, can they keep the GDP growth rate at 7.5% with Chinese investment? Yes, they probably can. But this comes into the difference in policies between you know, the Chinese approach to this and the, the Americans and the Europeans. Mm. By providing duty-free access to the markets, this creates jobs. So this is effectively a bottom-up strategy. Mm. And from my perspective, that helps, keep, helps the CPP uh, stay in power because the, you know, there's jobs. And one of the most important things in a democracy is the economy. Yeah. If the economy is bad, it's very difficult for an incumbent politician to stay in. So from that standpoint, I, I hope that this doesn't go that direction. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Mitchell, for spending your time talking to VOA. Thank you, sir.